This video deals with three facets of the English verb system, tense, aspect, and voice. Now you've already met tense and aspect, and voice is what's new in chapter 15, but we're going to go back over all three of them because they can all occur together, and people tend to think that when they see a clause, it's something like present perfect active or past progressive passive, and that that combination represents just one indivisible construction. But the theme of this lecture is going to be that each of these things is separate. In fact, tense, voice, and the two aspects, all four of those things are separable from each other. And so you can change just one of them at a time, and that's what I'd like you to be able to do. I'd like you to be able to control each one of these independently in a clause. So this should help you, this video should help you with exercises 2, 3, and 4 of chapter 15. So let's start by talking about each one of these things separate, separately. First let's talk about tense, and first let me tell you that English has no future tense. Now I hope that's a review for you. I hope the whole tense section is a review for you, but if any of this part is unclear to you, then you should probably go back to the verb chapter or go back to chapter 2 where the author talked about the basics of tense. And if you remember, the authors mentioned right away that tense doesn't correspond perfectly to time, so it's not that every time we want to talk about something in the past, we use the past tense. Or in order to talk about the future, we have to have a future tense. We don't have a future tense. Now, some languages do. If you've studied French or Spanish, for example, you know that you can put a suffix on a verb, and that changes it to future tense, just like we put a suffix to mark past tense, right? But in English, we can't do that. We can do different things to talk about the future, like we can say going to and then a base verb, or we can use the modal verb will, or we can just use the present tense. We do that all the time. We say stuff like, he leaves tomorrow. We can use the present progressive, he's leaving tomorrow. So just bear in mind that English has no future tense. The choice with tense is binary. The default tense is present. And then you also have the option of doing past. And you mark tense, if you mark it at all, you mark it with an inflection on the verb. That's a suffix in English. We don't have grammatical prefixes, so our inflections are suffixes. So the past tense suffix is usually quite easy to see. Most of the past tense, most of the verbs in their preterite form are regular. So there's an example of that in the first sentence here. The prospect of economizing interested him. You can easily see that interested is the past, is the preterite form. So this clause is past tense. And there are also ways of marking irregular verbs, ways of marking the preterite in an irregular way. So in the second sentence you see, in the 61st year of his life, Liam Pennywell lost his job. That's not lost, right? But it's irregular, but we can still see and hear the marking. Do is the same way if you look at the third sentence. What did he care, right? What does he care is present tense. What did he care is past tense. We can hear it. There's just a very few verbs where you can't hear the difference in the preterite form, so you can't hear the difference in a past tense clause. For example, the verb cost. Second floor units cost less to rent in those days. We know that's past because we have in those days, right? If it said second floor units cost less to rent, we wouldn't know if, if it was a present tense clause or a past tense clause. By the way, my examples today are mostly coming from Noah's Compass by Ann Tyler. Good book. I'm still in the middle of it. Okay, so the point here was that the past tense is usually marked in a way that we can hear or see if we're reading. And there are very few verbs where it isn't. With the present tense, it's a little more complicated. You remember that there's a plain present and a third person singular present, right? The plain present, by definition, you can't see. So look at the last clause here, I guess. Guess is a plain present. Now, if you have trouble, Distinguishing the plain present from the plain form, which are different animals, right? If you don't remember that clearly, if you don't remember the why they're different, 
and how to tell them apart, go back to the video where we talked about the difference between shape and form. So, guess here is a plain present. Raps is a third person singular present. You see the, the S, right? And you hear the S uh, wraps things up. So, the third person singular present tends to be marked. That is, we can hear it and see it. The, third, the plain present is, tends not to be. Um, but nevertheless, we know that the verbs are present. Now, with the aspect, our choices are also binary, but it's a little bit more complicated because there are two kinds of aspect. There's a perfect aspect, and there's a pro progressive aspect, and they work independently. Each one of them is binary. Each one can be switched on or switched off. What you do with one doesn't determine what you do with the other. Now, they're paraphrastic, meaning that you have to identify them not completely by the form of the lexical verb, but also by something else that goes with them, and that something else in this case is an auxiliary verb. So each one of them uses a specific auxiliary verb and then selects a specific form for the lexical verb. So let's do perfect first. Again, your choices for perfect are yes or no. Something's non-perfect or it's perfect. Obviously, non-perfect is the default, no? All right, the auxiliary verb for perfect is always have, and the lexical verb is in the past participle form. You guys wrote the rules for making perfect and progressive, right? You're gonna remember doing this about now when you worked in the discussion board. And those verb, those rules work. If we, That's how we identify a clause. It doesn't have anything to do with the meaning. If we look at the clause and the auxiliary verb is have, that's the important verb, the one carrying the tense, carrying the subject verb agreement. And then the lexical verb is in the past participle form. The clause is perfect. It doesn't matter at all what it means. Here's some examples. Have you made up your bed yet? See the auxiliary have? See made in the lexical, see made in the past participle form? It's perfect. The second one, he'd never owned a tie rack before. See had, the auxiliary verb have. See owned, past participle, that's also perfect. Now they work independently from tense, so the tense can be going either way. You mark the tense, of course, on the auxiliary verb. So have shows present and had showed past, shows past. Those are both perfect. Now how about progressive? It works the same way. It's either on or off. It has a different auxiliary verb though. And a different form of the lexical verb. So the auxiliary is be, and the lexical form, the lexical verb is in the gerund participle form. You thinking of examples? Okay, here's mine. Now neither of these are perfect. This is just progressive. This is non-perfect and progressive in the present. I'm not exactly calling it retirement yet. Your auxiliary verb is be and am is in the present tense. Your lexical verb is call and it's a gerund participle. How about if we want to do a past progressive? We change the auxiliary verb be to the past tense so you get she was. And again, the lexical verb is Gerund participle, crushing. Those are both pro progressive and non-perfect. Now what happens if we want to turn on both perfect and progressive? We get two auxiliary verbs, right? One for each aspect. So you get the auxiliary verb have here, which indicates that the clause is perfect. Then you get the auxiliary verb be, which indicates that it's progressive. And then you get the lexical verb in the gerund participle. How about tense? Well, we'll look at the first auxiliary verb. Have is not had. So we have a present tense here. So we have a present, perfect, and progressive. How about if we switch on the past tense? Then we get he had been teaching. We have had marking perfect, and that's where the tense falls. And then we have be, marking progressive. Then we have teaching, the lexical verb. See, here's a chart that sums up how you can turn 
each thing to one. So you can flip each switch to one side or the other, off or on, present or past. They mean different things. Pause the video if you want to study this chart for a minute. And then we're going on to the really fun system voice. Now voice I'm going to dwell a little bit more on. People find it more difficult. It's not conceptually harder because it's also binary. It's really similar actually to the aspects because it's binary. It has a default which is active and it has a mark, more marked choice which is passive. Those are the only two choices for voice in English. Well, that's probably not technically true, but assume that it is for now. And at least it's the only two choices that we're going to look at. And it has a specific auxiliary verb, and that's be, like the progressive. But the lexical verb is not a gerund participle like the progressive. It's a past participle like the perfect. So it has a unique combination of auxiliary verb and lexical verb form that identifies it. So you see, it's not technically more complicated than either of the aspects. However, it is attested that native speakers find it much harder to identify. There's a lot of confusion about it on the internet. There's some confusion about it even in grammar books. So I'm going to try to slow down at this point. Um, and you can speed up if you are getting it. But otherwise, feel free to take your time on this part. Most people find it difficult. All right, we have covered the basics here. The auxiliary verb is be, and the lexical verb is in the past participle form. Now, maybe you want to pause the video and think of your own examples here, but here are mine. Two, in the first example, there are no aspects involved. Why is it that you're needed only for transitions? Now, ignore the, the matrix clause, why is it? Look at the subordinate clause. You are needed, blah, blah, blah. You've got the auxiliary verb be, and you've got a lexical verb in the past participle form, needed. That tells you that it's passive. Do not even think about the meaning here. It's purely the form that tells you that it's passive. And we can identify tense because of the auxiliary verb. No surprise there, right? It's are, you are, is present. So we've got a present passive. That is to say, everything about this clause is default. The present tense, the non-perfect, the non-progressive. The only thing that's marked about it is that it's passive. But we can also switch on any of the other options. So look at the second one. I've switched on the perfect. Or rather, Ann Tyler switched on the perfect here. Have any arrests been made? Now you see an auxiliary verb, have. That's telling you to look for perfect. And perfect wants a verb that's in the past participle form, right? So what it gets is been. But been is also an auxiliary verb for made. So we have the be verb, auxiliary be verb, and we have made, which is a past participle. That's passive, right? Be verb and past participle. So we got a clause here that's passive and also perfect. And because have is in the present tense, we know it's present. So it's present perfect passive. Have any arrests been made? What if we switch off the perfect and switch on the progressive? I'm being evicted. You have now. Remember, the progressive and the passive both use be as their auxiliary. So you're going to have two forms of be here. You have am, and then you have being. And then because it's passive, you have the lexical verb in the past participle form, evicted. Now, what if we switch on both perfect and progressive? This actually did come out of the corpus. This you might strike you as a rare, as a rare construction, and I wouldn't disagree with you, but it certainly is possible, and it certainly occasionally happens. Perfectly grammatical. It has been being paid regularly. <laughs> How would you like to make a sentence like that? So you got have for perfect. You have B for progressive, and then you have B for passive, and then you have a lexical verb in the past participle form. Everything's marked about that clause, except for the tense, right? So let's do the ones where the tense is marked. Let's do past. Here, a clause that's just past passive, no aspect. 
Liam was reminded of a photographic series he'd seen. So now the be verb is there, and the lexical verb is in the past participle form. So we know it's a passive. We don't care what it means. It's a passive. It's got a be and it's got a past participle. We also know it's past because that auxiliary verb is marked for past. It's not is, it's was. Now, we can throw in perfect. Brucey e. Winston had been caught. So we have be, be caught is passive, right? Have is for perfect, but we're in the past, so it's had. So now we have a clause that's past, perfect, and progressive. Past, perfect, and passive had been caught. If we switch off the perfect, switch on the progressive. Ignore the matrix here. Susan couldn't see. Now look at the, the um, embedded clause. What was being done to Jerison's chest? So remember, if you have both progressive and passive, you'll see the be verb twice. So you see was, and you see being. And we know that it's past because the first auxiliary verb carries past tense. It's was and not is. Could be is, right? We can always switch either, any one of them, either on or off. We can always change one thing about a clause. If we turn everything on and we want the most marked kind of clause possible, we get, he said what had been being said by people like Richard Holbrook. Again, this comes from the corpus, so... I didn't even have to make one up. You've got have for perfectness, and you've got two forms of be for progressive and passive, and you have said, the lexical verb. And it's in the past tense because of your first, because your first auxiliary verb is past, it's had. So here's the point for this part of the lecture. Grab onto this. When you look for passive clauses, when you're asked to identify them, do not think about the meaning of it. It's really irrelevant. This is purely a grammatical question. Of course it's not completely unconnected to meaning. Of course we use passive clauses. Now you're talking about usage, right? In usage, yes, we use passive clauses for various reasons that can be discussed by discourse analysts, not by syntacticians. So we can say things like people use passive clauses when the actor is not important, the action is important. And that's largely true. Or people use passive clauses when they want to evade, avoid assigning responsibility or evade responsibility if it's their own, right? So you say things like, um, the lamp was broken, rather than telling your mom, I broke the lamp, right? Those are um, interesting points. They have a lot of validity and they're not part of grammar. We can talk about them as usage, but in order to talk about them, in order to say things like people use passive clauses for specific reasons, which people love to discuss. This is a very popular topic. You just Google it and you'll see. But in order to do that, you have to be able to pick out a passive clause. So don't beg the question. Don't say passive clauses are being used to do this. And I've identified these passive clauses by the fact that they're being used to do this. Don't say, well, this clause is being used to avoid responsibility, so it's passive. That's, for one thing, circular reasoning. For another thing, it's confusing grammar and semantics again. You identify a passive clause, first of all, and in order to talk about them, you have to identify them, and you identify them by the grammatical characteristics. The what auxiliary verb is there, and what form is a lexical verb in, and that's the whole story. So here, look at this, what I found on the internet. What is active passive voice? To know whether you're writing in the active or passive voice, identify the subject of the sentence. Okay, I'm, up, I'm good with them up until there, because the subject is a grammatical property, but then look at this. Decide whether the subject is doing the action or being acted upon. Don't do that. That's thinking about the meaning. The meaning of the clause is really not going to help you. To identify a passive clause, look and see if there's an auxiliary verb be and, a, and the lexical verb is in the past participle form. And I understand that's not as simple. That is, it's when, if it's in the present tense and there's no aspects marked, all the aspects are switched off, and the tense is also default, then it is simple. It's tricky because of all the aspects and stuff. Nevertheless, that is the way, and it does work. That is the way you do it, and it does work. So here, take this passage. 
There are three passive constructions in it. There are three passive clauses in it. So pause the video and read this until you've found three clauses that have a lex an auxiliary verb be and a lexical verb in the past participle form. And then go on to the next slide. Okay, here are the clauses that are passive. In each one, you see was, which is be. And then you see a past participle, used, given, provided. There are other meaning, other sentences and other clauses in this passage that have similar meanings as far as actions, as far as receiving actions, as far as non-technical passivity, you know, just being a passive person, whatever. But there are only three clauses that fit the grammatical characteristics. So let's now practice transforming some. Here are some clauses I've made up just to keep it simple. And I've put a variety of different tenses and both kinds of aspects in here. And this is going to be the trick when you do the exercise in the book. It's change the voice only. It sounds simple and it's so not simple. Change the voice only. Keep the tense the same and keep the aspects both set to the same switch. So for example, number one, the tense is present. The perfect is off. The progressive is off. So change, make a passive clause. It's going to mean something different. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about introducing other characters in here. Um, by, changing, by changing the voice, you do change the meaning. That's why we have it, right? Um, so make, with the first one, you want to make a passive clause, but it still needs to be present, non-perfect, and non-progressive. With the second one, you see the tense is still present, right? Perfect is still switched off, but progressive is switched on. So after you change number two, you should have a clause that's present, progressive, non-perfect, and passive. So identify for each one of these the tense and the settings for both aspects. Then they're all active right now. Change them to passive by using the be verb and putting the lexical verb in the past participle form. But and then check to see that you still have all the same settings for tense and aspect. Then go on to the next slide for the answers. Okay, here are the answers with the clauses turned into passive. And everything else kept the same. Tense and aspect kept the same. Check your own answers against these and then go on to the next slide for a different, for, and we'll do it the other way around. Check your answers here, email me with any questions, and then go on to the next slide. There's another exercise. And here, we'll do it the other way around. These clauses are all passive. And it's the same trick. And do the first one together. We've been observed. I've mixed them up here more. The other ones were sort of in a logical order, and now they're not anymore. Um, so think harder about the tense and the aspect. Let me do the first one with you. We've been observed. The first auxiliary verb is have. This tells you two things. It tells you the tense right away, right? Have is present. And then it tells you that there's perfect, the perfect is switched on. Have is the auxiliary for perfect. And then our other question is progressive. Is there any progressive happening here? No, there's not a gerund participle in sight, and there's only one form of the be verb, and we already know that passive needs a form of the be verb. So we have a sentence that's present, perfect, non-progressive, passive, 
What we want is present, perfect, non-progressive, active. Can you do it? That's going to be, let's see. Present, perfect. We've observed. Now try that with the other ones and then go to the next slide for the answers. Here are the clauses turned into active with the tense and all the aspects kept the same. Email me any questions about these. Otherwise, let's go on to a different kind of transformation and your book is also gonna ask you to do this for one of the exercises. Suppose we have passive clauses and we wanna change them to active, but keep the same meaning. We were changing the meaning with the others, right? But there's actually, for a passive clause, there's normally a more default form there's an active clause that matches up to it and has pretty much the same truth value. Of course, there's a different effect when you say it. A lot of those have the uh, displaced subject right in the by phrase. So that, if we change it back to the default form, the, the object of the preposition by will then become the subject, right? So here are some examples. But then Liam was brought up short by what the woman said next. Now, we have a displaced subject, what the woman said next. And then we have Liam in the default form. That's going to be the object, right? And then the verb, of course, is going to lose its auxiliary verb because active verbs don't necessarily have them. What we want to do is keep the tense and the aspect. That's the tricky part. So let's first analyze this clause. It's passive. We can see that because it has the B and brought the, lex the past participle. What tense is it? It's past because B is in the past tense. It's was and not is. Is it progressive? No, no gerund participle and only one B verb. Is it perfect? No, there's no have and there's only one past participle. So what we have here is a past tense, non-perfect, non-progressive, active. Passive, sorry. Let's change it to active, but make sure it stays in the past tense and does not acquire any marked aspects. Did you get it? What you've got is this. But then, what the woman said next brought Liam up short. Make sure you had brought. Brought is the preterite form as well, right? So again, that's a question of shape versus form. But we have changed it there so that we have a lexical verb in the preterite form, so we have a past tense. What we did, and notice that the sentence, the clause was originally in the past tense, right? It was was. So what we did is we gave an active voice, but it's still past. And it's not progressive and it's not perfect. So do that with the next three. You have displaced subjects in each one of them. So you have something that you can use for the subject as is in your active clause. Analyze it first to see what tense is it and is progressive switched on and is perfect switched on. After you've changed it to active, check it and make sure those things are the same. The tense is the same, this the aspect settings are the same. Then look at the answers on the next slide. And here are your active clauses. Everything except voice preserved. Notice that I don't have to change other things about the sentence. You don't have to move things around usually, hardly ever. You hardly ever have to move anything around or change. Do not, don't do this. Don't change a coordinate clause to a subordinate clause when you do the exercise. You might get a clause that's stylistically bad if you change it from passive to active. Yeah, there are some cases where one voice or the other sounds a lot better. Don't worry about that. Focus on the grammar. Change nothing except the voice. So that's pretty much the whole story. You analyze a clause such that you can categorize it on each of four dimensions, right? Tense, 
progressive aspect, perfect aspect, and voice. And then you can change just one of those things at a time. For the curious, let me just show you a couple of clauses that demonstrate that infinitives also have an active and a passive voice. You don't have to do any exercises with these. It's just if you're curious, I just have always liked this aspect of English. The two sentences here, the first one has a bare infinitive, and the second one has a two infinitive. So look at the, inf the clause that is the complement of could. You see, be altered by osmosis. The head of that clause is be, right? Naturally, a modal selects a bare infinitive for a clause. But that be has a complement that's a lexical, that's a lexical verb in past participle form, altered. Similarly, in the second one, the complement of hope is to be joined by the man at the center of all this controversy. And the head of that clause is a two infinitive, which hope selects, right? But the two infinitive is to be, and the complement of that is joined. It's a past participle, so that's passive also. Be verb plus lexical verb in the past participle. Now, both of these clauses could be made active and preserve the meaning, just like we did with the most recent exercise. Think about if genetic traits could be altered by osmosis. Think about just that, the, the, take, out, take out the if, that's the preposition, right? And look at the clause that's the complement of if. Genetic traits could be altered by osmosis. By osmosis is a displaced subject. Can you put that back in the subject place? Rewrite that sentence and make the verb active. Make the clause active, rather. Voice is actually a property of clauses, not verbs. Now look at the second, the second one. The man at the center of all this controversy is a displaced subject too, right? Put that as the subject of the clause. And then look at the way I rewrote them here. Is this what you did? He wondered sometimes if osmosis could alter genetic traits. You've got osmosis back in the subject place, the default place, and you've got a verb alter genetic traits. And you don't have any auxiliary verbs. In the second one, we hope the man at the center of all this controversy will join us. Now you don't have be joined, you have join. So those are active infinitives and passive infinitives, just in case you wondered. And one last thing, which will not give you trouble. I've never seen anybody have trouble with the gap passive. Your book talks about an exception to the rule that the auxiliary for the passive has to be B has to be a form of B. And it's an exception and it's not an exception because really a true passive clause does have an auxiliary B. But there's a clause that strongly resembles the passive. But instead of in the place of B, we have the verb get. So we don't exactly call those passives, but we do call them get passives because they work so much the same way. See, he got hit. It's just the same as he was hit on the head by a burglar. It has a different tone, right? We actually use this one more in colloquial speech. This one, I watched a, ch I watch a charging young male get caught by a buffalo hoof. So the first one was past tense. The second one is present tense. Neither one of them has an aspect marked, but they could. The third one is also present. Lots of people get hooked on the park experience. Those work pretty much the same way as a regular passive. And I think you're going to see one of those in an exercise, but I don't think you'll have trouble with it. So remember, once again, the tense, the two aspects, and the voice of English are all separable. With any clause, you can change only one of them at a time.